Shuffling feet like a dancing queen Note for note hums a melody She got the rhythm of living the dream now Saving the energy for the crowd Cause the sun is rising in Denver town Oh, we keep on running till the beat runs out Welcome to be my guest with me, Mary Honan, on Lear Media TV, uh, supporting the Samaritans, Limerick and Tipperary. And my guest here today is Margaret Cleary from California, Los Angeles, California. Hi, Thank Margaret. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for inviting me, Mary. You're very welcome. Jeepers, technology before we started. You're so patient. <laughs> yeah. Margaret, how did you get involved in Irish dancing to start? Um, well, I was born in London of Irish parents. My father was from Boris of Cain, Tipperary, and my mother was from Rathmore, County Kerry. And um, in London, I, I tell everybody that until I was 11 years of age, I thought everybody had Irish parents because I lived in uh, West London, in Hanwell, and um, everyone in my um, grade school um, St. Joseph's in Hanwell had Irish parents um, and we were fortunate that when I was about seven or eight uh, Irish dance classes were offered at the um, church hall, St. Joseph's Church Hall in Hanwell and I, as far as I can remember it was like an extension of school. Everybody that I went to class with during the week Monday to Friday went to Irish dancing Saturday morning um, and it was just normal. Yeah. Um, my teacher was Joan Long from Dublin. Okay. And um, an absolutely beautiful dancer, um, won the All Ireland many times, terrific style, uh, very colourful character. I have some great memories of her in class, uh, teaching with a fur coat and holding it back behind her with one arm and a cigarette in the other hand and wearing uh, the tiniest feet and she used to always wear these little pastel um, uh, uh, sling back heels and that's my memories of Joan Long teaching on a Saturday morning Amazing um, memories you'd have and uh, what happened was my sisters I had four sisters and we they all started dancing and I was pretty useless actually I just went along for the, the fun of it on a Saturday morning with my classmates um, and then my sisters um, we started doing competitions and they started winning championships my sister Pauline won the Great Britons under nine I think and they were pretty good and I think as the oldest sister I thought oh, I'm not having any of this so I started practicing at home and unbeknownst to me I would lift myself up on the back of the table in our dining room to look in the mirror over the fireplace, uh, little realizing that was helping me get up on my toes and you know, uh, all of that. So, um, so then things started to happen. I started uh, winning competitions as well. So by the time I was 11 and took the 11 plus and went to uh, secondary school, um, but I do know that that's when um, a lot of the, the, the girls in class, you know, stopped dancing when they went to secondary school. But by that time, I guess I was hooked and I'd started winning championships. And um, I, uh, and so I stuck with it. Um, and um, then uh, when I was, I think I was listening to Michael Johnston's interview yeah. that you did. 
And I found it so interesting because there were so many parallels because, you know, we were London Irish, London Irish. And um, like he mentioned, you know, your uh, age groups in those days were, you know, under 12, under 16 and 16 and over. Yeah. And um, I, we transferred schools from this. Oh, there, oh, there you go. <laughs> Richard Griffin is going to kill me, but I, I've never shown him that picture. Um, but uh, that's a picture of Richard. He won the senior championship at one fesh in London. I can't remember which fesh it was. And I won the minor under 12 and he was presenting me there with the trophy. Yeah. And then right above that, next to that then are three of my sisters and that's Pauline uh, with a championship cup. And I think that was at the new Elton Fesh, which June Wei uh, mentioned in her interview. Yeah. Amazing. So I transferred the year. Um, I missed my whole under 16 year because um, we transferred schools. And I don't really understand why, but I do know that we uh, were out of dancing for a whole year that we were told that we had to stay out for a whole year. And there was another dancer who danced for Eddie Hickey, Mario O'Connor, who was out for 18 months. And there was all sorts of, you know, disputes about um, having to stay out on transfer. But anyway, so I missed the whole under 16 year. Um, and, uh, but I was very fortunate that I went to um, Ted Kavner, who was of course an absolute legend yeah, and, uh, um, uh, Mr. Kavner, as we used to call him, um, telling me that he used to make up all those teams with coloured buttons. <laughs> he used to, I don't know how he did. I wish now that I, I had been um, <clears throat> able to watch him do that. But apparently he worked out all the figures on a table with coloured buttons. Wow. So amazing, amazing. Isn't it amazing? Oh, yeah. you, you, uh, that was 1976, May the 15th. Yes. 1976. Yes, that was the senior team. Uh, we danced, uh, I want to say it was at the Irish Centre in Camden Town. Um, that was, I think, the last year that I danced competitive. Yeah, there's a few in there. You can't see them. Teresa Kinsella is in there. Yeah. And uh, Julie Brooks, John Brooks' sister, was on that team as well. Um, and James Murphy, whose wife, Olivia, teachers as well. My cousin Deirdre went to, um, went to uh, Ted Kavanagh. Um, she'd wear my, my solo costume when she was competing in Ireland, but she'd wear her class yeah. costume when she was competing for Ted Kavanagh in London. He was very strict. Yeah. And he definitely, but um, I learned a, an awful lot. Well, I learned a lot. Obviously, Joan Long taught me to dance. Um, but I learned so much from Ted Kavner. Then I think I tried to um, model my own classes on um, the way he would handle classes, his discipline and um, structure. But isn't it amazing? I think it was Gary Healy was saying that, you know, there's positives, you know, as much as you talk about, isn't it wonderful that people st stay loyal to teachers and things like that. There, you know, the one advan the one thing that you learn, I suppose, from being at uh, maybe more than one school is the fact that's how other teachers do things. Each each teacher has their own style, and you and you learn you you learn a lot as well along the way. You also learn from being in the one school uh, yes. all your life, but you you don't lose. I I don't think by um, being with 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 several schools either because you 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 learn. I, I liked the way this teacher did that, and I liked the way this teacher did, did this, and I'm going to adopt this from that teacher and that from this teacher from in my own school. So it informs you. Oh, absolutely, and um, I can honestly say, Mary, I'm learning every day. Yeah. Um, and I learn a lot um, when, uh, you know, when I, when I go around judging and I'm, I'm mixing with different teachers and adjudicators and, and you know, we, we all have the one thing in common and we chit chat and we'll say, well, how do you do this? Or how do you do that? And, you know, you share ideas and, um, you know, and you learn a lot. 
you really do. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, I agree. Joan Long and Ted Kavner had very, very, very different styles yeah. of teaching, yeah. but both both had their merits. Yeah. Um, I think the main reason why I left at 15 was because um, there was nobody my age. And, yeah. um, you know, obviously Kavner had um, a lot of students my age in teams and everything else, and it seemed the natural progression. Um, so, um, yeah. No, they, they both... Very strict, but um, I would have liked, um, I, I was saying there to somebody earlier, I would have liked, um, I always liked strict teachers. Even yeah. in my even in my primary school, the nuns that I loved mm. were terrorized everybody else. And I don't understand how people can say, oh, Sister Kevin or Sister Maliki, they dreaded them. I loved them. Maybe yes. I was oblivious to them giving out to me. Maybe I was so used to being given out to at home. Well, yeah. It's normal. I am. Um, I absolutely loved my secondary school my grammar school that i went to um it was called gumley house in Isleworth, and it was the faithful companions of jesus they were the nuns they used to wear the frilly little ruffles around you know in oh, front right. of the veil yes <laughs> and um oh, and actually oh, i have to tell you our nuns had sorry. a full wood book and the full oh. long, full long um uh, garments and the rosary beads and yes. they'd, they'd uh, twiddle the rosary beads um, going along every day. And we had one nun that ended up wearing the shorter skirt and showing her hair. And, yes. um, uh, but I was so used to the nuns completely closed in and yeah. always wanted to be, thought I'd, I was going to be one. Well, actually, my father, um, uh, when I remember when I went to my interview with Mother Josephine, as they called her, um, I remember being highly embarrassed when he I, I told her that uh, he felt I had a vocation. Um, and actually, for the first year or two at Gumley, I had special dispensation. I used to be given time off some of my classes to attend Mass in the chapel with the faithful companions of Jesus. And um, yeah. And it was, um, didn't happen though. I didn't. Well, I used to, I lived in Wembley and uh, I was born in Wembley and we, we very had, close, very close to yeah. uh, Hanwell, the 83 yeah, yeah. bus from Hanwell to Wembley. Yeah. And I used to always go around in my bare feet as a child. And the nuns were passing one day, the, the um, poor Claire's. And yes. one of them, uh, my mother was in a house of all my, all my father's side were Protestant and she was the only strict Catholic. And she uh, and I jumped a wall with an ice cream and I had I, I had no, no shoes on me. And a nun said to my mom, I think she's going to be a Claire. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was about four and I think she's going to be a Claire. And, uh, you know, and I always had this in my, I loved, I think I just loved the outfits. And I thought I, I could yeah. see myself now as, uh, as a... <laughs> well, it wasn't meant to be for either of us. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I do have to say, Mary, that one of the, um, the highlights of my dancing was that I was invited back to Gumley House to judge a fesh. Well, um, yeah, so I just thought it was so weird that, you know, um, I had seven great years at Gumley as a student, and um, even though they tried to um, encourage my vocation, it didn't happen. But to be back all those years later, sitting in the gym and being in the grounds of um, the, the convent, uh, the school, uh, judging a fesh was just so bizarre. It was uh, Hilary Joyce uh, ran her fesh there that year. But all I'm saying is I did have, um, a, uh, I was very, very lucky to go to that school. Um, and my two of my, Anne and Pauline also went there. And um, Marcelo and Angela then went to St. Augustine's, another uh, Catholic school in Ealing. So you, at what stage did you decide to take your TCRG and how difficult was, was did you find the exam? I, like I passed my TC straight away, but the, you know, the AD, I, you know, it, I just, it was the interview I, I failed. I failed. Um, yeah, and that saddens me to everything that. except it's the interview. And I just, you know, it was just, 
I, I, I don't know. I just worked myself into a frenzy, I think, with, with yeah. panic. Well, um, I, that saddens me to hear that, Mary, because I am an examiner these days. Yeah. And, um, you know, my uh, feeling is that everyone has passed when they walk through that door. Mm. So it's up to you then, um, you know, to, and, you know, some people do get nervous and, and it is stressful. I, I remember my own AD exam, I found it stressful. Now that I'm on the other side, right, yeah. I, I kind of wonder, you know, I, I try not to be intimidating at all. Because, oh, no, I couldn't imagine you being intimidating. <laughs> well, my student might not say that. But, um, yeah, I, um, yeah I, I, just to put people at their ease. Um, it's, um, but, you know, it's people bring it upon themselves, a lot of people, different circumstances. Um, you know, I think a lot of people want a formula on how to pass this exam. And there isn't really, I, you know, and I get one of my pet peeves is when people, um, you know, tell me afterwards or they advise me that, you know, they, they, would, they were advised and received training from non-examiners. Um, and they're often given some, you know, not particularly great advice. Um, so, you know, I kind of think that the um, interview is like back in the day when we used to have oral adjudication at Feshes, you know, where, where I don't know whether you recall when people would stand up and they'd say, yeah. well, I like this competition because, and I like this Brendan dance. Brendan de Glynn oh. used to always do it. Brendan de Glynn used to always do it. Oh, that. yes. I remember dancing in front of him many times. Yes. I love yeah. him. I love yeah. him. Yes, you indeed. always go down the line and tell children. And I think I would be that type of an adjudicator. I, I'm more than happy to, uh, to tell, you know, if people come up and ask or if, if they want you to tell the children, you know, where, what they can do or how they can improve. I'm more than happy to do that. Maybe it's because I admired Brendan de Glynn so much. Yes, but, you know, and I do agree with you, uh, Margaret. I think it's so important when somebody goes in for the exam that you you try to bring the best out in a person rather than uh, fail them. Do you know, yeah. my, my first experience was my paper banged on the table, and and the table yeah, banged, and I shouted at, um, "Did you change your mark?" And I just was distraught mm. because I couldn't remember I, I I just couldn't remember it was so long it was two hours before and three hours before and and from then on I was gone I knew it myself afterwards I just should have held myself together um, well uh, my in my AD my TC I at 1976 was the last year that I danced competitively in the teams um uh, I was fortunate that I was on th three years. We won the world in, on that senior team, and uh, we um, and I had, you know, had given up solos. Um, oh, I'm not sure what year it was, but I know that the I missed the first world because I was under transfer, and the second year, 1971, my former teacher was judging, which wasn't a great idea. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, so I'm not sure how many, I think I only danced at two worlds. I'm, I'm not really sure. But I do know that um, I danced at one All-Ireland and it was the year it was under 17. And um, I, I was very fortunate to win the solos, the solo rounds. I was first in the reel and third in the hornpipe. Anya Tuhi was the adjudicator. Oh, and it was a great judge. Um, I, uh, so I gave up... Um, a competition in 76 but um, I was at college then and I used to spend my summers in Greece and uh, just yeah. on vacation and so uh, I came back from Greece and uh, my mum said I have some bad news and some good news and whatever and she brought in the she said well you missed the date for the TC exam which was I think was in October and I said, no, 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 I've got to do it this year. I have to do it now. And I think I put in a late application and was accepted. And I think I had two or three weeks to prepare for the exam. And I literally, I just learned the book 
in those two weeks, I just, and I wouldn't have known, remembered any of the book after that because it was just one of those quick studies. But then when I did my AD, um, I took more time with it. And I was very lucky because I did it in California and there were just two candidates, myself and Patricia Kennelly, who I know you interviewed recently. Yes, she's in San Francisco, I'm in LA. Um, but one of the, the examiners on my panel was Molly Farrelly. Lovely, and you, Molly. Molly Farrelly, oh my God, I have so much time for her. Um, and um, I had forgotten that she, that she also danced for Ted Kavner at one time. Oh, I didn't know oh. that. Yeah, she did. And so uh, when I went in, now I had been out of dancing for a while. And um, when I went in to do my dancing part, she said, okay, Margaret, Kilkenny races, which of course was the, you know, Kavner set. So after I have to pass through the Kilkenny races, she then gave me the other Kavner set that we did, Planksty Drury. And then for my third set, she said, okay, Margaret, now um, the hunt. And she sat back, uh, no, she, uh, she was sitting forward and I, of course, I had forgotten. Of course, I did the hornpipe. The Kavner hornpipe was what I did because I didn't have any set prepared. And she um, started dancing it under the table with me. And when it came to the end of the second step, she sat back to see what I was going to do for the last four bars and just grinned. <laughs> Mid off of the last oh, four bars. Oh yeah, yeah. But but it's just the very fact that I didn't even think, oh my god, she's gonna know exactly what I'm doing. But um fortunately um I passed the AD and um yeah, and then I went on to take my examiners a few years, much you know, I don't know what year that was but had to go through the books again think, and again through interviews. I yeah. think the, the, the time I got my AD, uh, I have never forgotten the, 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 the people who were, well, I, the, the three people who were on my panel and they were the loveliest. They truly were. I mean, I had on the previous occasion in America when I did it around September 11th, Anne Richings was just so oh, lovely. Yeah, lovely. Never, she was just so lovely and Dennis Dennehy. But yes. when oh, I got, well, when I got, Dennis, it was yeah. just so lovely. But when I the, the year I, I when I passed it, uh, it was Dennis Dennehy, uh, Madeline Hall, and John Colnan. Oh yeah. And John Colnan was just such. I'll never forget him. For and I always say to him when I meet him, you're one of my favourite people in Irish. Yes. Death. You know that because you passed me by AD, and he laughs every time. But he was just. He epitomized himself and Dennis Dennehy that Madeline, the the eagerness for to see you being your best. Yes. And so did Anne Richings. Um, yeah. to, to bring out the best in you. Yes. Um, and that's the way it should be. And that's the way it should be. So put, I think I think we also put a lot of pressure on ourselves, exactly. you know, and especially yeah. in an exam situation. Um you know, and it's hard to tell people, you know, relax. Well, I mean, we always say, relax, oh, relax. You start thinking, like, you, know. thinking. you start yes. thinking, what's he going to ask me next now? And if I say yes. this, will they ask me that? You, you, there is no formula. I no, think no, there really is. And, 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 um, uh, and like I say, it is, I always say it's like an oral adjudication. You just have to explain to us why you felt this person, you gave this person first, second or third. Yeah. You know, what was it you like? What, why, you know, and what did you think of the competition and that kind of, just like we were sitting in the, I always say to people, pretend you're sitting in the front row at a fresh. That's how you prepare, you know, and what, and what do you think of the competition and why did you choose that dance? You don't have to agree with me, but I'd like to know why you think that. But we hear, I mean, obviously we can't divulge what happens in the exam room, but we hear some really, really, um, Strange stuff. <laughs> so you wouldn't yeah, want to, these people to, judge, to, to, to people's, to people's um, to, I suppose to excuse people as well. I think things come out of your mouth inside in the exam that you're thinking, where, where did, did that come out of my mouth? Because you're, you, 
that there's something that happens between the brain and the mouth that that, <laughs> that that doesn't always you know and you're saying to yourself i how could i've said that you know mm. she would be absolutely thrilled to see you getting yes. first woman of the year yes um yeah, uh, because uh, what happened was when I, I told you I took my TC in 76 and um, I was still in college. I did a degree in business in London and um, I uh, started Irish, uh, teaching Irish dancing then in 76 probably and it actually got me through college. Um, and then when I uh, finished my degree, I... You know, those days we would, uh, a lot of us would take a gap year uh, when we would travel or do what have you. So I went to Greece to work for a year in Greece, just casual work. I was um, waitressing on a beach in Greece and had a fabulous summer. Um, you speak uh, the language. Well, I did learn. Yeah, I did learn. I wouldn't be able to... to to give you to give you a few words in Greek now, but yes, I did learn the language, um, and then I had a place um, at Aston to do my masters. And uh, but once I had my year in Greece, I decided that I wasn't going to continue with the masters, and I went back to uh, London. And I um, so in seven so before I went to Greece in seventy eight. I gave up my dance school in London and I uh, decided then that I would never teach or start a class again unless I knew I could follow through with it because it was really upsetting to build something from scratch and then just to give it up. I mean, I have no regrets um, because I went on to Greece and um, I ended up working in Greece for five years for a travel company. I was area manager um for a first of all olympic holidays and then into sun and um then i also spent a year working in romania and uh yeah and it was uh, during the time when ceausescu was still in, in yes in power and so that was a huge experience um and up until then i had always said that uh, the only way to learn a language is to um, be in the country and immerse yourself in it. And I was proven very, very wrong because all the Romanian students that I worked with were fluent in God knows how many languages and they'd never left the country because none of them had any passports. So it was a very um, restrictive... Um, Margaret, what was it like there? Because I'll tell uh, you, my cousin uh, went, went over to Romania to adopt a little... Girl. Oh yeah, and oh, on her way out, her husband went back for the passports to the hotel. A little boy started to pull on her jo on her jacket, mm. and kept calling her mama. So she took mm. Stephen as well. Oh boy, adopted Terry okay. and Stephen. And both yeah, it was um, it was a, it was um, a very different experience uh, living and working there. Um, yeah. Uh, we, I had a Romanian guide who um, ostensibly was there to help me with the language barrier. Yeah. But actually, I wasn't mixing with any Romanians really anyway. I was working with tourists. Um, yes, it was um, a very, very different experience. Um, I learned a lot um, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And then I spent the winters working in Spain for the same company. And um, then uh, I met my husband in Greece. Uh, he was a chef. Yeah, he was a chef. English, but he was the chef. And um, that's the reason I came to the States, because he was offered work um, at a restaurant in Los Angeles. And so I moved to Los Angeles. So I was out of Irish dancing for, oh, I'd say eight or nine years where I had no connection whatsoever with dancing. And um, when I uh, came to Los Angeles, um, I was out in uh, an Irish, uh, it was a, uh, the Irish uh, Celtic Arts Center on Hollywood Boulevard one night and they had a, a trad music session and I got up and danced. 
and some said, oh, can you teach me how to do that? Can you teach me how to do that? And so I said, no. Um, but I did end up, um, I taught free of charge for a year at the center and I didn't want any commitment. And then of course, people started putting pressure on me. Would you start a class please? And I said, well, I'll only teach adults because I knew that I could probably stop that at any time. Yeah. Um, cause I didn't want to make that commitment again. So I started an adult class and, um, I used to have about 60 to 70 adults every Tuesday night for Kaylee dancing. So I said, no competition, just social dancing. And um, we, uh, and it was fun. We would spend two hours doing um, Kaylee dancing and then we would all go, to, well, not all of us, but a lot of us would go to the Irish bar um, in West Hollywood. And, um, and it was a great social evening. And I met a lot of, I made a lot of friends. Yeah. in the Irish community um, that way. Um, and, um, you know, it's always been circumstantial. I never uh, was, you know, decided that I wanted to teach Irish dancing, that that's what I wanted to do. That was never my, my goal or my passion. It was just purely circumstantial. Like I say, I taught in London when I was at college. And then when I came to the States, I started teaching adults because, you know, it, it's Irish dancing is like a disease. Oh, it is, Mark. You know, however hard you ever want to walk away from it, it's always there. It Some always somehow, it it's always brought me back in. Yeah, it, it pulled me back in. I describe that and so, as well, about how if you leave it for a while, you've only to be inside in a fesh for, for a half an hour. Yeah. And it's like you never, you never left. Well, that's true, because the first fesh... Uh, Basically, one of the first fashions I attended in um, California was um, an outdoor event. Um, it was an establishment in, in Southern California, the Brothers of St. Patrick. It was um, a seminary, um, but they used to have an outdoor festival. And I went there. Um, I'd heard about it, so I, I drove down there. Didn't expect to know anybody or see anything. And I walked in, and lo and behold... The judges there were um, Ron Plummer, who I knew from back in the day, I, you know, and uh, Tony Comerford, oh, yeah. who, again, was a very close friend of mine back in the day when we were competing. Um, and just they were just these familiar faces, and it's like I'd never been away. Um, so slowly but surely, I got pulled back into it. And I think it was when my own daughter was um, turned three and I had to make that decision. Um, well, you know, do I put her in Irish dancing or not? And I thought, you know, I really don't want to deprive her of the good times, the good memories and the friendships that I had experienced. Yeah. And so I didn't know where to send her then. So I started my own children's classes. And that was uh, the main class I started in then was 93. And that was it. And I've been teaching full time since then. Um, and before that, you know, I mean, I, I wasn't, like I said, I wasn't involved in dancing and I was walk, working in the corporate world here. My first job when I came to Los Angeles was for the Olympics in 1984. Wow. That was a, yeah, big, a big first job. It was a fantastic job, and it was a, I absolutely loved every minute of it. Um, I, arrived here, I arrived here in January 84, and in February 84, I was fortunate enough to be hired. Um, and my background was human resources with my business degree. So I um, was involved in recruiting all the, um, I was in the transportation department, recruiting the bus drivers for the Olympic Games. <laughs> wow. And it was, I, I absolutely loved every single minute of it. Wow. Um, yeah. That so, is, and it's such a worthwhile job to have, isn't it? Yes. It is. You know, it's not just, it's not just an airy fairy. I was just, I mean, airy fairy. I got that from the book behind without even realizing. Isn't that what that book is called? Airy fairy? Yeah, I think so. I'm not sure. Why. That's, 
I'm not sure why they're there, Mary. Is that because they're Beverly Cleary? She's not related to me. Not related to you. <laughs> no, she's not. No, she's not. <laughs> not I, thought, I saw lots of these books up on your on your 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 uh, Facebook page, and I thought she must be related, or maybe. No, I don't know why they were too. there. And she I have to give you. Her. I have to give you credit for you must have been really digging on Facebook to come up. <laughs> I saw lots. I saw them up on a few, a few different pictures, and I thought maybe oh. Margaret's writing under an assumed name. Oh well, you know, it could be, but no. <laughs> <laughs> maybe Margaret's the real author of Muggy Maggie. Oh yeah, well, maybe I'm sure I've been Maggie. called Muggy Maggie. I and mean, that's one thing. All my dance uh, people who know me from dancing know me as Margaret Cleary, uh, so they they call me Margaret. But when I was teaching. Um, started teaching here people started calling me Maggie Maggie and I absolutely hated it but now I'm so used to it that I actually when people introduce me uh you know I, I always when I introduce myself I say oh my name's Margaret Cleary or Maggie so um yeah so muggy Maggie <laughs> lovely Sally oh, friend Houston well Sally um and I um we used to share a room at the commission meetings. So um, uh, Sally and I have had some very, very um, good times, fun times. And there we are with Isabella Fogarty. Isabella. And I think it was Sally, or maybe it was Isabella, that called us the Golden Girls. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that was taken, uh, that picture was taken when we judged the Oireachtas in New York together in uh, Philadelphia, I think, I'm not sure. And then of course, on the other side is Sally and myself and Pat King in his younger days yeah. in Vancouver. Yeah, Pat King hasn't changed at all. Oh my God, I met Pat King. I think the first time I met Pat King was um, when I was competing in solos uh, with Kavna. Um, it, it, you know, we didn't take it really that seriously. It was all about the friendships and the fun. And I remember going to the Worlds one year and I went by boat uh, from Hollyhead over to Dublin. And um, after the Worlds was over, there was a group of people, Tony Comerford, Pat King, Isabella Fogarty, uh, Paddy Moriarty, I think Aidan Comerford was involved, um, said, Oh, um, I think actually it was Pat King's mother was having a party in Dundalk. And they said, uh, oh, would you come up to Dundalk for a few days? And so I said, oh, okay. So I called my mother and I said, um, you know, the, the, the return fare on the boat was flexible. Um, it wasn't um, set in stone. And so I said to her, I called her and I said, you know, mum, I'm going to be... Uh, I'm going to stay on a few days. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll catch the boat, you know, maybe in two days time. So I'll be back and went up to Dundalk for a few days. And oh my God, the crack was mighty. He's we a had man, an isn't he? amazing time, amazing time. All of us, um, great friends. And I remember calling my mum and saying, you know, um, I'm not sure when I'll be home. Um, cause the party just went on for days. Um, and that was Dundalk, 1975. I think that was when Ron Plummer met Carol Walsh and um, Frankie Roddy as well from Derry. Uh, I remember meeting him in Los Angeles um, and uh, he taught me the traditional sets, the uh, Ulster version of King of the Fairies and um, all the sets. And he was just, he was, he was just amazing. He was a nonstop dancer. He had so much energy and he just was a, a great dancer yeah. yeah so yeah so that was so we became friends um uh sally yeah. is such a funny woman um i judge the only time i ever judged with sally in, uh, was in the states at um milan healy um oh yes uh, yeah uh fancy dress or halloween um yes uh, and sally mm. came as a bumblebee <laughs> uh, nothing surprises me, Mary. Nothing. <laughs> it's just worth it. She made the costume herself. It was a yeah. work of art. 
I mean, yes. as if she wasn't already a work of art, as I said to her, you know, this, this big yellow, black and white, black and yellow bumblebee. And she said her, the stinger, um, parents had to keep lifting the stinger up every time she tried to sit in the seat, uh, judging. She has a great attitude uh, towards life. life. And, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and great fun and I enjoy her company and I miss her actually at the commission meetings um, when because uh, we used to literally we used to uh, share a room and um, she would always be great fun and uh, well she's still at the commission well, meetings she's uh, no she does not, not anymore. No, she's not. She the last year she hasn't been on the commission, but, oh, I uh, didn't which is know sad, that. but. Oh, yeah. that's a pity because oh. uh, it, it needs people like Sal. You know, Irish yes. dancing in every aspect uh, needs needs people like Sally. Do you yes. know? They, 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 you know, if nothing else, to cheer you up. <laughs> you know, to and we need cheering up these days with everything that's going on. Yeah. Beautifully segued in there, Margaret Cleary. Um, how is COVID affecting you? Um, well. It's uh, making uh, sure that we keep versatile and um, we just have to go with the flow all the time. I mean, we have to keep uh, trying to invent ourselves all the time to keep the, the you know, it's the, the students that it's affecting the most. Um, I mean, we have maintained most of our students um, through all of this um, via Zoom, uh, which I hate, but um, it served its purpose. Um, <laughs> like I, I told you, hated more. Yeah, well, I think I told you at the beginning, this is my Zoom station. And um, the reason it's here is because this is the hallway and this is Studio A. And outside is on the patio is Studio B, where Katie normally uh, takes... Um, a class um, so we've maintained our students through so far so far um, but we you know we've done a lot of things to keep them interested the parents said they've been very grateful because it's given them a sense of normalcy that you know non that uh, you know they're still coming to their class they put their uniform on um, every class and they they come into zoom we got back into the studio June 13th, I think it was, for a couple of weeks. And then we were closed down. But do so, you have, do you mind, sorry for interrupting. Do you have yeah. a uniform? Do they wear a, a, a uniform? Oh, yes. That's yes. The, now, that's, you got that from Ted Kavanagh. You brought that from Ted Kavanagh, the organization. and, 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 and Oh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, they wear, um, our school colors are purple and white. That's a fabulous um, idea. Yeah, and so they wear a purple T-shirt and black shorts um, every class. And that, that, that everyone wears Indeed, a uniform. Quality in yes. the class as well. Yes. yes, absolutely. So, no, we have no high fashion at and class. And as well as that, you would have worn a uniform in school. Oh, yes, and I loved my uniform. I loved the uniform. I don't get this thing about, oh, get rid of the uniform and let children wear no. what they like. You had the child then that wouldn't be able to afford the Nike shoes or the designer clothes, all cut print. It becomes a fashion show unless yes. you have, have structure and, and equality within the class. I, yes. think, I think uniform is fabulous. And I wear, that's what I wear. Um, in fact, Pat King used to give me a hard time for our feshes that we would run. Uh, we used to run an outdoor fesh, the fesh at the fair. And um, I would always have my uniform, my purple T-shirt and my white shorts <laughs> for every day of the fesh. Um, so oh, he's doing a lot about that. But um, yeah, so, they, so we tried to, you know, keep the classes going. We went into the studio June 13th and then, um, you know, we were closed down again. So yeah. ne currently now we are um, outside. We're fortunate that the main studio that we lease is, um, has a large parking lot. And I have to say, we have a terrific group of parents 
extremely supportive. And um, we have the Dads Club, as I call it. So we called on them this last week to come out and rebuild a stage in the parking lot so that we can keep classes going, which is a challenge because, of course, of the heat here as well. So um, it's all been a challenge. And um, I have to say that um, I haven't missed traveling because I was doing a lot of traveling, judging and meetings and so that's one part of COVID that I, I don't miss is the traveling. But um, I do think that um, we're doing a lot more work because um, when we were in the studio, what would have been a two hour championship class turned into a five hour class because we would have to split it into smaller groups. And then we would have to have our 15 minutes uh, CAD, as I call it, cleaning and disinfecting and then taking temperature checks and, you know, before classes and following all those guidelines. But we have been very proactive in that um, we um, set up a pen pal system uh, oh. with our, our students, that, uh, between our students and the Scanlon School in Birmingham. Um, so they made friends um, we set up some treble reel challenges between um, our school and a school in Canada and a school in Minnesota. Um, all friendly stuff, but keeping the students engaged and having them form friendships yeah. during time with people who are going through the same thing. And then we did a, uh, we called it Fesh in Place, where we... Um, we spent one weekend, which we would not be able to do during normal circumstances because of traffic, but we um, gave all our students the opportunity to set up their own fesh in their driveway. And then Katie and I um, drove th that weekend between us 400 miles each around Los Angeles to all these people's houses who we, we didn't even know where they lived before this. But we drove up and it was amazing the way some of these families uh, reinvented and recreated, I should say, the fesh situation. We drove up to houses where they had, well, they had a blown up picture of Pat King and Merv Bell in a couple of the driveways as musicians. They had raffle tables set up. They had soda bread table competition. Um, they had decorated it. They had, you know, it was just absolutely, it, well, for us, it was really uplifting. Um, for the and emotional, I'd say. Oh, my gosh, yes. And they, they all, every family, some families set up nothing. We pulled up, but we had our own table and chairs and bell and... Um, you know, banners in the car and we'd set up for the fesh for that, you know, child or that family. And then other families went to town and some of them even brought their neighbours out as the audience, social distancing, of course, and it was a neighbourhood event. Um, but so we did oh, that. Lovely. It was exhausting. It I was exhausting. In Ireland, though, Margaret, because you couldn't, you couldn't be guaranteed from one second to the next if it was going to rain. You'd, ha you'd, yeah. have to, you'd have to bring yes. out... We do. The weather is, um, it is really, you know, uplifting that the weather is so good. Uh, I mean, um, but it is, now it's causing a problem because it's hot. So, uh, but we're doing our classes yeah, in the... What so. do you think of, I mean, I've asked most people, I suppose, because of Nyla Leary's comment about, uh, I don't know if you saw it, about... Um, uh, open platforms and that. What do you think of the, the, the idea of open platforms? Well, uh, do you understand really, the concept of why we split in the beginning? Because I was- Not scared. really, um, not really. Um, I, um, the split was 69, I believe. And so nine, I would have been 15, uh, 1970 was my year out transfer. Mm -hmm. um, all I knew was that things changed in the sense that some of the uh, familiar adjudicators I used to have like Rory O'Connor, Peter Bolton, um, oh a whole bunch of people were no longer judging the feshes I was going to. Um, other than that I didn't really know any different. Yeah. Um, 
I really didn't know any different. I couldn't tell you. I, I wouldn't have known what the difference was. Um, and I have to say, it doesn't really, I don't really have that much of an opinion on it at the moment because where I am here in Los Angeles, we actually don't have any other organizations yeah. of any. I think, of any only, I think he brought it up in relation to areas where you might have yes. a school teacher and one yeah. commission teacher or um, a COGOL CRN and a commission and not enough between any of them to have a fish. Yes, yes. And I mean, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I do think that your opinion normally relates to how it affects you or, yeah. you know, the circumstances. Yeah. And like I say, um, as far, I don't know of any COGOL teachers here in Southern California. Um, or That's any other. There point. are a couple of weeder. There's uh, no football here in Limerick either. There, well, yeah, there would be Carmen McKenna because she was Kogol. She came to commission and she went back to Kogol. Mm. And um, yeah, she would probably be. Uh, but I don't think her classes. I'm not sure. I, I, I think she's still teaching. But um, yeah, she'd be the only. Kogol teacher in Limerick. Yeah, so there isn't any Kogol here in Southern California. Um, I mean, I mean, I'm I'm happy with with the circumstances I have at the moment. Um, that's not to say if there wasn't something else offered, I would have to look and see, you know, how I would feel about well, that. And and it was the thing. My students. And Bernard, well, imagine if you had a combined World Championships. Could go on for two weeks. <laughs> well, maybe not, after COVID, maybe not after COVID, Mary, because I think one of the, you asked me how about COVID was affecting us, but I mean, I can tell you that um, we have had, we have not had any new students, any beginner students since COVID hit in March. Normally we would have a big open house. Um, you know, we do a big open house the weekend of St. Patrick's or the weekend before uh, oh, where yeah. we would get, you know, we would get our new students and we would have, we would be, and through our performances, you yeah. know, um, uh, most of our business comes from word of mouth or people have seen us performing and we do a lot of performances. Um, you know, um, March, we would be, a, be crazy. They call it, you know, March Madness and it is for us. Um, and that's where we would do all our promotion. And we missed, apart from missing all the financial aspect of it, we also missed all the opportunities to bring in new students and new blood. And Zoom, um, as I said, that's we've maintained amazing. our students, but not our beginners. A lot, it's very hard to engage um, beginners on Zoom, especially the younger students. And yeah. um, I, um, I was saying to someone that, um, you know, we've all got the stories of how many pets we've seen on Zoom um, over the last few months. Um, but, you know, when I find myself after teaching all these years, um, having a conversation with a pink fluffy unicorn, <laughs> the five-year-old is introducing me to, I'm thinking I've really lost the plot now. <laughs> this is not what I expected. <laughs> So um, yeah, so we, we, so I, so I'm concerned about the future of um, of Irish dancing in general because, like I said, we haven't got we haven't got the beginner students uh, coming in. We haven't got the new blood, and even the um, the the championship students um, and the more advanced students, they um, you know they we have to give them hope that we are going to have competition and goals for them to work towards michael dillon has brought up a subject about uh, online i think he's yeah. he, you know online um uh, fashion app. what do you think margaret well um i don't think uh i i think um well i'm not a fan of zoom um mm -hmm. my intermediate students oh, love I'm zoom and have been thriving on Zoom. They've been thriving on Zoom because they're learning new material all the time and they don't have to listen to us shouting at them to correct it. Um, and they, um, they can be dancing completely off time because we wouldn't know. Oh, no, the difference. Because of the delay. 
Um, so I, I, I don't know um, about online feshes. We are hoping to have our own fesh, uh, which is scheduled for October 3rd. Um, we are hoping to do some kind of version of it um, based on what we're allowed to do and obviously in the safest possible way. But I do think that if we take it off the table and we don't offer that goal for our students, then I think we're going to lose. Well, I don't think it will last much longer, Margaret. Maybe I'm just forever at the office. I don't know. I think everybody's been, uh, from the very beginning, everybody's on a different page um, with, with all of this. Yeah. Um, it's you know, good. it's, yeah. And no one is wrong, Margaret. No one is wrong. Everyone is just trying to, if you were told, I mean, I got the, the, the testing done straight away because I'm yeah. asthmatic and I was clear. But from the day that I had the testing done, this, I've come to the station today. It's well within the two kilometers of my house. I haven't been past two kilometers since this happened. Uh, but I won't wear the mask. I'm a, I'm 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 um, asthmatic, and I have my cousin's daughter is profoundly deaf and nonverbal, and her husband is deaf and nonverbal, mm -hmm. and I just think like they're already excluded in society here in this country. They learn sign, they learn lip reading first, then sign, because mm -hmm. the majority of people, no one learns it in school in, in in mainstream schools, which it should be taught. So they're already excluded by virtue of their being deaf and nonverbal. Now they can't see. So they can't see the person speaking to them. They can't see their facial expressions, nothing. What the frustration is, is that uh, none of us know. You know, none of us know um, what's right and what's wrong. And none of us know how long it's going to take um, to, to get back to normal. Um, so, and there'll be a lot of people that will talk about what's a safe vaccine. Yeah, because I mean, when my mum was living in England with, before I was born, she was, she was very, very ill um, when, I was, when she was pregnant on me. And she was, they were convincing her, they were practically forcing her to take thalidomide. Yes. Now, as we all know, had my mother taken the thalidomide, yes. there wasn't, I don't think there was anyone born that wasn't deformed. From yes. thalidomide, and you, yes. you, and you, you want something safe, yes, and you want a vaccine, but you, you worry that people are just going to just rush out the minute a vaccine comes in and start taking it, mm -hmm. and that it'll yes. be worse, you know. Yeah. So I think it's something I, we're going to have to live with, and get on with our lives. Well, I think we have to try, and I mean, we have to try and do the best we can with what circumstances we've got, you know. Um, Everything happens for a reason, and I don't know what the reason for all of this is. But um, yeah, it's uh, it's the uncertainty, it's the not knowing. I think if we knew that, you know, we had another three months, or we had exactly. another six months, or exactly. we, you know, then we could deal with it because then you can plan accordingly. Yes, it's absolutely. the not knowing. It's it, it's the goal to be moved all the time. Yeah. Yes. April, it's all, it's it's yeah. August now. It's September. Schools are opening, and then it could be October, and it mightn't be until January. Yes, exactly. And like I say, it's the not knowing, um, and that we just have to be on our toes all the time. Like I say, with with the class, you know, uh, we were on Zoom. Now, you know, then we were in the studio, and now we're in the parking lot. Um, and I thought at one point there. Just, you know, 10 days ago, we would be back to shelter in place. So um, we don't know. We but don't you know, know. You're lucky you've got good weather. I yes. mean, we have, we have good weather right now. But tomorrow, even in an hour's time, it could be raining. Yes. What's going to happen in the winter if this isn't sorted yes. out? Yes. yes. Where are people going to go with children? Yeah. 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 It's very... Um, I mean, I think if you if you think about it too much and you dwell on it, it can be very depressing. So I think, you know, um, I know for our students, we're completely upbeat and we're like, you know, yeah, we're getting ready for the fesh. Seven weeks, seven well, I weeks. I don't know what's going to happen in seven weeks, but I we'll do whatever we can. Great, Going Sorry? I think your fesh idea is great. 
Well, the, we did that fesh, the, the, the fesh in the driveway. So that's done and dusted. Um, and that was an idea that was shared with us by Mary McGing from Cincinnati. Yeah. She called it the porch fesh. And it was slightly different because she fortunately lived in a big area in Cincinnati where most of her students, you know, live. So when she went to each student's house, it was within a certain radius. Here in Los Angeles, we have students, you know, literally, um, you know, that drive an hour, an hour and a half to us. So we were driving all weekend um, around to these uh, different houses. But it was absolutely worth it. And would I do it again? Absolutely, yes. Um, so much joy from those children and seeing them. Um, and so that's why we have to keep moving forward. And we're going to do this fesh. And I don't know what format it's going to take. Uh, we're looking at parks. We're talking to the city about permits. But we will make it happen because we have to give them something to, to work towards to. and to look forward to. And to make Otherwise. all this worthwhile. Yes, yes, yes. Margaret Cleary, you have been a star. You really have. You really have. And you have I no feel like I haven't stopped I talking for the last that. hour. I didn't think this green screen would, would last um, because the lighting, uh, we're... It did, Mary. It did. We are lighting. I'm just using a lamp because we can't get the equipment down from Dublin because they can't move past a certain distance. Mm. So we can't get proper lighting in our camera. So, again, so you're making the most of the resources that you have. That we have. And I mean... It's, That's what you have to do. It seems to be working now up on top of it, if you saw the state of it, it's up on the table. <laughs> but it's, it's working. Yes. Thank and you. That's really, what, that counts. Thanks so much for coming on. Oh, thank you, me. Mary. Thank it's you. An absolute pleasure. And yeah, okay. thank God you. bless Margaret. And to you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.